If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. It reveals that all opposition to us is but a lie. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, no one can be against you. If you've entered in to his rest, nothing else matters. You're always on top. You're always ahead. You're always in him. And you're always victorious. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Welcome again to Kingdom Embassy International. We're going to get started with the teaching. We have some important information for you today to activate you in new things. How many want to be activated in new things? Activated. Activated. No boring Christianity here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What if on the other side, what if right around the corner for you was the most amazing, exciting life? Something your head couldn't even dream up, but your heart knew all along. What if? What if? Hallelujah. Well, today we're knocking down walls. We're doing a demolition today so that we can rebuild, so we can set some things up and in place and established for him. And we benefit too in the process. Amen. Amen. All right. Welcome to the online audience. We are so glad that you joined us. The message today is going to bring life to you and peace. New ways of thinking. I'm going to challenge your thinking today. The title of this message is The End of Church as You Know It. The End of Church as You Know It. Amen. All right. So y'all can have a seat. Thank you very much. Love y'all. How many of you are loved today and know it and not afraid to show it? <laughs> you know, some men get... They, they just don't want to say that, do they? And they need to just be melted by the fire and presence of God, the love of God, to the point where they say, yeah, I know it, and I'm not afraid to show it. I'm loved. If I'm loved by the powerful one, nobody can be against me. I'm victorious in all seasons, at all times, no matter what. And it's a nice place to be. He's the master strategist. Our father is the master strategist. The scripture declares that we have Jesus himself, the risen king, as our head. And he does the thinking for us. We do the walking for him. Amen? It's a good, good situation, isn't it? We don't have to plan out and strategize everything. He does it. And we just carry out orders. And so when we live like that, guess what? We always win. Amen? How, how, you guys like winning? in everything in life how about peace joy benefits blessings ability to bless and lift to other people it comes through this relationship it's a symbiotic relationship we depend on him he depends on us he's the head we're his body and we bear much fruit scripture says that we are appointed and ordained to bear much fruit and fruit that remains and that's what this message is all about so I'd like you to just turn my mic down a little bit. I have kind of a echo or maybe we'll figure that out. All right. Thank you. So this is what we're going to do. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's a good day to be alive <laughs> in Christ because that's a whole nother life. All right. Hallelujah. So here's what we're going to talk about. I said the end of church as you know it, and I want to share this too, the beginning of life as he knows it. The beginning of the life that he purchased on the cross, that he gave to his people. It's been locked up for too long, and we're going to deal with that. Hallelujah. I'd like to start by honoring verbally uh, the founder of this ministry. The founders, that's Apostle Charles Ndifun and Pastor Donna Ndifun. We call them mom and dad around here. They are spiritual mother and father, for real. So let's give them a big shout out. Thank you for them, Father. Thank you for them. Thank you for them. 
How'd you like somebody to give you, walk up, give you the keys to a Mercedes Benz and you never thank them? That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? They give you billions of dollars, you never thank them. We got to thank God for this gifts that he gave us. He gave us these two, this couple. So thank God again and again and again and again and again. Thank you for them. They have made this possible. And what they do, if you haven't been here before, if you don't know their message, it is um, very empowering, enlightening, strengthening, and it is the gospel, but they're living it and walking it out on a very extremely high dimension. And so because of that, when they speak it to us, it lifts us up to their level. And I love something Apostle Charles said some years back. I heard him say, we don't warehouse people around here. And that's, there's a goal and a vision and a reason why they set this up, this place, the, the embassy. This is called the embassy and those watching online are part of Kingdom Embassy International because this is an international movement. But we do have this building, we're making good use of it and we open it up to anybody in the public who wants to come and hear the truth of the gospel and walk it out. If you're not interested in walking it out, there are a couple thousand others around here that you can go warehouse in. But this is not a storage facility. This is a training grounds. This is, we call it special forces. You're trained to do things in love that confuse the enemy, that take him by surprise. He's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. No, I thought it was only Apostle Charles that I had to be afraid of. No, it's you. <laughs> And you show up and it says, okay, it smells like Jesus. I'm out of here. And they're gone. And this is how this is all about. It's when Jesus started this 2,000 years ago, he didn't start it for his generation only. He started it for every nation on earth and every individual to be able to partake of it. And so he set up a plan on how that can happen. And the counterfeiter, the resistor, the enemy, the loser, the little devil, he has tried to stop that and he's being overrun. And this is what we're here to share today. This is what I'm sharing with you. How many of you were part of the uh, global, uh, let's see, global mission square meeting recently? Raise your hand if you were a part of that. Kingdom Embassy International global mission square meeting. Raise your hand really high, I wanna see. We just got about five of us, six of us. Listen, you need to go review that meeting. This was a strategy. If you, no, I know there's maybe some new people here, some new faces to me anyway. Hello, hello. But uh, if you're a part of this and you're all the way in, you know, both feet in, then I want you to go back and look at that video, watch it and understand the mission, the, the reason for the mission, the vision, the heart, all these different things, because God has a place and a part for you in it. And so you want to understand the big picture in order to understand what you're getting involved in right? That's what this is all about. Consciousness, understanding of life. The, King, the Global Mission Square meeting was about what we're going to do. And, and I want to share with you just a few points about the 10-year vision. We're not going to go over each point, but we have a 10-year vision at Kingdom Embassy International. And it's not small. And it needs you. Amen? Amen. One of these is to uh, plant an apostolic church in every major city of the world. Now, what that means, apostolic church, what he means by that is simply a reference point, a group of people, part of the network who is concerned not only for their city, but for the rest of the world. That's what it means by apostolic. Jesus said, go into all the world. He told the apostles, and then they were to reproduce themselves in all of us. And that's why today we can talk like this, so we can do these things. It's because it's, his goal was that it's always going, 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 never stopping to the ends of the earth. Otherwise, guess what? We don't reach there. Am I right? If we don't go, we don't reach there. So the goal is to go and do everything else with that. Make disciples, bring the gospel to people. Um, and, and leave a mark on, the uh, on our generation that God has destined us to leave. So we're going to do that. Amen? We're going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm in. I'm so in, I'm telling you. And I know some of you are. And the rest of you, I want you to jump in to the fire today. So there was a few other points. Uh, there's 10 points, but I'm just going to mention to commission 100 ministers worldwide every year. 
Now, the reason why I'm reading this is because most of you, and I don't mean just in this room, whoever's watching this, it could be in the future who are watching this, don't have any idea what that means. And we're going to talk about it. They plant all these, or bring these churches, 100 ministers, um, establish and release the fivefold ministry to the church with power. How many of you guys like power? Hallelujah. Teresa likes power, right? The other day. Her leg was grown out. Hallelujah. Where's Racklin? Racklin was behind that and Jesus behind Racklin. The power of God heals the sick. It frees the mind. It changes people's lives. It gives them better jobs and gives them better identity, understanding of themselves. The power of God is absolutely wonderful and it is our life. So what's it mean fivefold ministry with power? You guys know? Do you want to know? You want to know more about it? We're going to talk about it today. But first, we need to tear down some things. Can you imagine building a, a house on top of another house? Not a good idea. Tyler, am I right about that? That's not a good idea. <laughs> That'd be a lot of work. Is that right? <laughs> All right. So when Apostle Charles and Pastor Donna started this, it's like they were, they founded something, they started something to be an oasis of love and peace and grace and to extend it to any and everyone. They said to the other groups, send us the ones you don't want, the ones you think are too hard cases. Send them to us. We'll take care of them. Jesus will heal them. They're going to be fine. And they're like in a jungle, you know? So you got to clear some vines first, you know? And that's what, if you notice Apostle Charles teaching, he's often clearing vines, religious vines. And we're going to continue that work. Raise your hand and say, I'm going to continue that work. Hallelujah. All right. So we're looking at some of these points. And the goal is to leave a mark for future generations that cannot be erased. Now, to do that, you cannot operate as church as usual. Hello? You cannot operate that way or you are just absolved into the background. You're not making any dent in the generation. Doesn't matter how much offering is raised. Does not matter. We have to be different. We have to be totally different. God has made us different and we need to see it. And so today I'm in here not as Pastor David. I'm in here, you can call me that, but I'm here as Mr. Reformation. Hallelujah. We're bringing the reformation that God has ordained for our generation so we can turn around and show up and destroy and demolish the works of the devil. And the point is what? Set the captives free. How many of you guys know some captives out there? Some in your family, some friends, some older friends, some people in society, some nations, some cities. They need you, equipped, ready for the challenge. We got good news ahead of us. Amen? We're walking right into it. We walk into it like a holy wall, and it absolves into us, and we give it to others. So, Mr. Reformation, you can call me that the rest of this day. All right? That's the hat I'm wearing today. Let's look at Matthew 21, 43 to 44. Matthew 21, 43 to 44. This message is to sober some of you guys up. And it's to keep me sharp as well. Because the word of God has a double edges. Takes care of the one who's speaking it. It's a blessing. It can't be matched. We need this. So this verse says, uh, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God. Now Jesus is talking to Israel. Israel was established at that time to a large degree. Not what God was looking for, but they felt comfortable. They had their leaders. They had, uh, they're still under the rule of the Romans, but they had their system. They had the temple. They had the priests. They even had prophets. Well, they had John the Baptist, but they weren't listening to him very well. Some of them. But they had their thing going. They had the food supply. They had the kids going to school or whatever they did back then. It wasn't enough. And so when Jesus came, they felt they were already okay. You see? That's to me the greatest danger on earth. 
Status quo. Complacency. The idea that everything's good. I'm good. I'm fine. Messiah himself walks by and you say, I yawn. That is worse than the worst crime. That's worse than the people in the, in the pen, you know, in the penitentiary for the worst crimes. It's complacency. That's a wet blanket on fire. And we don't need that. But Jesus came to shake that up. And he didn't mind what he did in Israel shook all of Israel. You realize? He prophesied the destruction of the temple. He prophesied a lot of things. And it came and Israel suffered terribly, much of Israel, natural Israel, physical Israel, because they did not notice, they were not aware of the time of his visitation. How many of you know this is what Apostle Charles has been teaching, right? Discernment, recognizing your moment. How many of you know that's essential? Without that, we are similar to the brute beasts, an animal, because the Messiah with all his blessings, with our destiny is walking by and we say, I prefer video games. No, 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 no. I like a good video game, but I like the Messiah better. So when it's time to swap them out, oh, the video game goes, I'm following the Messiah. And the Messiah is multifaceted. He's glorious. Uh, he's amazing. He's love. He's got a lot of parts to his body. And he has a lot of things up here. He's strategizing for all of us. So we need to be ready to change, to move quickly on what he has for us to do. Because he's the king. He's the Lord. He's the head. So let's look at this verse. He said, the kingdom of God. Now this is the judgment that came on Israel because they did not notice what was going on. He said, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Repeat after me, shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. Say with me, God wants fruit. He made me for fruitfulness. I'm not my own and I owe him everything. All right, so Israel forgot that. Uh, most of Israel and Jesus spoke to the religious leaders at that time who seemed like they're doing everything well They got the rope system going. They got the synagogues. They got the priesthood They got they're following the law of Moses to a degree and they got it just rolling on schedule Over and over and they're looking good and they're the religious leaders and all this stuff And they feel like we've arrived and we don't need the Messiah. No They weren't bearing fruit Jesus was not happy about that and I want to show you the next verse. Let's look at, uh, yes, the next verse. Because you need to understand the kingdom of God. You don't want it to fall on you. Amen? We don't want the kingdom of God to fall on us. How many, you know, we don't want Uncle Sam or the IRS to fall on us, right? <laughs> we don't want no, some discrepancy and all of a sudden somebody's at your house. But you also don't want the kingdom of God to fall on you. Here's what it says. Whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So in other words, Jesus is the stone and he's the king in the kingdom of God and he shows up. What you want is just to follow him. You don't want to fall on him. You don't want him falling on you because it's a bad situation. And that's what happened to them. So I'm lifting everyone to a high level, a higher level, which is of accountability and responsibility. Because the king destined and desired and programmed you for fruit. And when he's looking for it, you want to just give it to him. You want to offer him the apple tree, the pear tree, the orange tree, the blackberries. Whatever it is he's looking for at the time, you want to be able to give it to him. And that's why we're here to get equipped. Am I right? Is that why you're here? Are the seats very comfortable? Is that why you're here? <laughs> I think you're here to get equipped. I'm here to get equipped and to equip you for the times that we're in, for the time that's here and that's ahead. Because these things are not jokes. These are not something we set up in a rote like the religious. No, when Apostle Charles says this is the year of manifestation of your glory, it is. And as it comes, follow it because it's here, surely. 
and the kingdom of God benefits those who are pliable to it. But we don't want to fall on the rock. It could grind us to powder. How many like the idea of being grounded to powder or crushed or broken? Jesus tells it like it is before it happens to try to warn people, to get them out of their complacency, to get them over to following the master, the kingdom of God, the way it really works. It works by following. It works by walking with him. It works by listening and receiving and following and doing. And it works by participation, not by observation. It works by a life laid down by love. And it is the most exciting life you could ever imagine. It's greater. I wouldn't trade the kingdom of God for all the money in the world. But many of you would trade what you have for the money in the world, right? I would gladly trade my house for the, all the money in the world quickly. I'd be like, okay, burn the house. Give me all the money. And I would use it for the kingdom of God. But when it comes to comparison between money and the kingdom of God, oh my goodness, not even close. So the number one thing in our lives needs to be finding and doing the will of God. And that's where all the benefits are for you, too. They're there. They are rosy. They smell like roses. How many like the smell of roses? Smell of roses is really nice, right? How many would you like a life filled with the pleasure of God? Just filled. Yes, yes, yes. How many all know it's completely available to us? And we're walking in it, but many of us aren't, and I'm going to get to that. Because fruitlessness is not good. Now listen, Apostle Charles, I'm, I'm, I'm being stern with you guys today. I mean, is that right? Am I, am I being stern? I'm being stern on purpose, because I love you. Apostle Charles, I want you to know a little bit about what he is not and what he is. And really, it's a combination, of course, that we, it includes Pastor Donna and Apostle Charles. But what he is not is he's not a toy. He's a gift. He is not uh, a stuffed animal, a flurry. You know, we can love him. Well, he is in a way. He's my teddy bear. Okay, he is a teddy bear to me. All right. But he is an equipper. He is the one who brings down the axe on whatever's troubling you to free you into another dimension of life. He is the one who fuels your jet. He's a servant. Many of us see and know that he's a great king. Amen? He's a king. So are we in Christ. But he chooses to serve us to bring out the kingship in us for others. Right? to get the gospel out further than our own living space into the other territories. So he has come, God has sent him here to fuel you to do your ministries because it's not about you. No, wait a minute, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. No, no, it is about me. Wait, okay, listen. As a baby Christian, I will tell you the truth. It is about you. He died for you. He raised you. But as a maturing man or woman of God, it is about them. It's not about you. It's about reaching those you are sent to and you're blessed in the process. There are people that God loves through you only. And you need to be in place so that he can use your face to love them right where they're at and to lift them up to the dimensions he has for them. So that's how exciting life gets when we're walking with the king, in step with the king hearing his instructions and doing them. It is exciting. Now, how many guys know that excitement? Yes. New and old Christians alike start to enjoy that excitement. But here's what happens. People get stuck on the traditions of men because we do really well in some areas. And all of a sudden, there are these blockers that have been raised up. And people, God's people, to a large degree, in this, it, throughout the world, will bump into those walls and then separate, it'll separate them from their destiny and they'll stay over here doing what God said, but he wants them on the other side of that wall. You get it? Am I making sense? I want you to know because God has things in store for you that are so mind blowing, so amazing. You in the back, you may be the next president 
and you got to prepare yourself for it with him. It's not a, nothing's apart from him. Everything is in total conjunction with the head. He is preparing us for things that are glorious that no man could ever amount to. No woman, no person is what I mean by that. Could ever amount to what he's got prepared for you and through you. So therefore it's not up here. It's in his word and in our spirit. And it comes as we're faithful in the little things and as we keep listening to the truth like this and as we obey it. All right. So what I want to talk to you today about is, um, I mentioned what a Char Apostle Charles is not, what he is also. But I want to talk to you about your ministry and specifically, let's start with church. Church. Let's talk about church. You guys ready to talk about church? Yes. Church. How many of you guys know what church is? You're going to get your church on today? Are you in the church today? Are you at church? All right, well, what if church lives in you? What if church, oh, I don't know if you guys are ready for this, but I'm ready because I've been living this a long time, decades, and uh, I got a message and it's powerful. And this will increase, this will cause us to go past the limitations to reach the dreams of the king of kings inside of us. So, what is the church? Do you know, I'm a language guy. How many of you guys know that? Those of you who know me, I'm a language guy. I like languages. I've studied several languages. I'm fluent in uh, Mandarin Chinese, for example. And I like languages. Uh, and I know a little bit about Bible language, Hebrew, Greek, just a little bit, just enough to understand what texts mean when I need it. And there are times when you need it. Do you know that the Greek language is huge? It's like this big. And the English language is big too, but it's more like this. Therefore, a lot of the words in Greek you can't fit into English. You have to figure them out by using a little thing on your phone. You just hit the button and you see what the Greek says, what it means. As someone who likes languages, I want to tell you all that church, that word in English, as I've found, is the most mistranslated word in the whole Bible. Have you ever considered that? The most mistranslated. There are a lot of mistranslated words, a lot of them. And when it's mistranslated, it can hurt God's people if we don't figure it out, if we don't dig it up. The teachers and the others dig it up and teach God's people. But this one church, I found to be the most mistranslated word. Actually, church is not even in Greek. It comes from an old English word, which is... Uh, it was originally Kirk, K-I-R-K, Cirque, C-I-R-C-E, or Church, C-H-E-R-C-E, C-H-E. -E. These are old English. Now, I'm reading from the book that I wrote called Return to Acts Christianity. I wrote it about 12 years ago after God asked me to. These truths were living in me, though, for about 15 years and percolating, and God would not let me write it until they were ready. And when the time came, it came out like a baby, and it's still alive and living and growing and running and thriving. And the truths in it are some things that God's people need desperately. All right, so church came not from that. Now, I want to tell you where it really came or what, what, what the word is in the Greek language. It is ekklesia. Okay, if you have pen and paper, you might want to write this down because this is something that once you know, you want to grasp and know the rest of your life. You don't want to just hear it and forget it, okay? Ekklesia, ekklesia. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ekklesia. Ek in Greek language means out of or from, out of. And then klesia means called, all right? So the makeup of the word, just the makeup, means a called out group, a group that was called out of another group, okay? So in a way, you could say that about us, that we are definitely, we were called out, right? We're not the same as the world. We were called out of the world when we believed in Jesus. And we entered into Christ, and we became a new creation. And we're totally set apart. So that is cool, it's wonderful to know, but that's not the meaning of the word. That's the makeup of the word. The meaning of the word, listen to me very carefully. 
That word, which was later translated iglesia in Spanish, in some other languages, it sounds like ecclesia, right? But that didn't take the meaning, that took the sound. The meaning was lost and has been buried in the rubble for thousands of years. It's amazing. The meaning of the word of ecclesia, and this is completely documented throughout, I show you a lot of documentation, and let me just give you one. Look at Strong's Concordance. That's the most relied on concordance of the Bible. You could find it there. The meaning is a governmental legislative body or assembly, a ruling assembly, a legislature. In other words, it's a political word. It's not a religious word. So all this time we've been getting our church on. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to church. Oh, this is church. We have a church up in here. We didn't know what we were talking about. Because the truth of the matter is political. It's a political word. In the Greek and the Roman empires, they all had ecclesias. And it was in the big city, the major cities, like Athens had one, um, Ephesus had one. They had these ecclesias. They were governmental bodies. It was like a congress or a parliament. All right? It's a legislation body. How, do you, how many of you guys knew you're politicians? You're a politician. You were not voted in. You came in by birth. And you're part of this elite group, which is not in these four walls, believe me. It is in Christ, and it is called and set apart for one purpose, to rule. Repeat after me. I was set apart to rule. Yes, you were set apart to rule. And hands down, meaning you're number one ruler. There are some other false rulers out there. You know, Jesus said that the devil, you know, every time you hear devil, remember, little devil. But Jesus said that he has a kingdom. Well, guess what? The kingdom of God rules over it, crushes it every single time. Does anybody have sickness here or something disturbing their mind or anything like that? Yeah? Would you like healing from it, brother? Come on up here, man. Come here. Also, I would like somebody in the legislature... All right. Who has never healed, has not healed the sick lately or has never healed. Would you like to come up, sister? I don't know if you healed anybody this week. Just come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Our sister here is absolutely amazing. So what is it, my brother? Addiction. Addiction? Addiction. And it's been troubling you. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And also you felt like ants in your sleep, like a little, like messing with your body, that kind of thing, in your system. And it also it affected your nervous system. But listen... Our sister here, Magdalene, if you don't mind, she's going to just put her hand on your shoulder. Now, this is not always necessary. We know at Kingdom Embassy International, laying on of hands is one way God heals. But I want full participation right now because what's going on is light is coming out of her spirit right now into you. So you can even lay down and put your hand down even right now, sister, because it's already done. It came out of your spirit into him and freedom from all that junk. It's been removed from you, my brother. Your nervous system's free from it completely. You're going to think new thoughts. You're going to understand new things. All right? And uh, your dreams, you know, they'll be fulfilled. But God loves you so much, he's actually giving you a big hug right now. Yeah? Does that sound good? Does it feel good? Thank you. You're welcome, my brother. Give me a hug. Love you, man. Listen. The world has told this man, if you'll stay up for just a quick second. See, if you say something like that, you're the bravest soul that's ever existed. You come up here and God clearly, definitely, there's no chance he'll leave you without being totally unchanged and touched and healed and blessed. Man, that's how he works. Your sleep is going to be sweet. But what does the world say to this man? Give him drugs. Give him this. Give him that. They said it to me. They said it to most all of us in here. It's lies. They're messing with your identity because they don't know your identity. But we see you and know you're royal. Have you believed in Jesus before? Like with your, your whole heart? At times. At times? Yeah. And so uh, what we want to do is let you know this. The life you just experienced, you felt it physically, but it was bigger than physical. Yeah. It comes from the throne of God who created our physical makeup, but he created everything on the inside too. And what he did is he sends people who are in his legislature, that's us, to come with the power of God to heal you, free you. He'll, he will take care of your life A to Z. And so what he wants you to do is this. It's simple. Completely, with all your heart, give yourself to Jesus. And that means you make him Lord. 
he will then recognize you in his kingdom as his person and he'll take complete care of you and that will extend what you just felt into your future whole life would you like that yes all right so here's what you do you say lord jesus can somebody bring another mic do we have another one because what god is starting right now in your life man he planned this day it's an amazing thing just the beginning all right he only he knows your great dignity your destiny who you really are so yeah if you just um give the mic so you say lord jesus you talk straight to him lord jesus i believe you have found me i believe you have found me and i have found you and i have found you and i give you my whole life right now and i give you my whole life right now no more me you're my lord now no more me you're my lord now amen amen, amen. welcome to the family brother give me a hug man. So when Jesus died, he died for that. He died to bring you in and give you something that you can never get anywhere else in the world so that you could know him and you can know the Father. And that's a beginning for you, my brother. That's just the beginning. That's first step. All right, let's clap and praise the Lord and welcome our brother. You got a family. Listen, welcome home, brother. Welcome home. Amen. So, what was I saying? We are the legislature of God. We contain God in us, and he works through us. The information that we need in life is in him that's inside of us so that we can rule. So we were destined, we were set apart, we were sent here to rule. And if, if anyone else needs healing in your mind, your body, your this, your that, bloodstream, whatever, before we, before we um, leave, it's yours too. Just, just come up afterward, okay? So God has big plans for you. But the point being is that, see how, who would want to disguise the governmental assembly and turn it into a church social club? Satan, hello? Because we will destroy him when we know who we are and we go into his realm. That's why the teaching on light is so disinfecting. Apostle Charles teaches about light a lot, and it's such a blessing. Every time we hear it, it grows deeper roots in us because it tells us we're light. The kingdom of darkness can't stand us. We go into its realm and it runs. It's amazing how we are. And that is the kingdom of light. And we are the legislature, the legislative body of Christ, of light. So everywhere we go, we carry Christ with us because we are his body. It's our identity. That's why the, but the, what the Bible says is put on Christ. Like clothing, put on Christ. What's that mean? Awareness. Awareness. Are you aware at this moment that you're in Christ? Like clothing, we're in Christ. Yes, I am aware right now. I'm in Christ. So therefore, if I go over to you, Christ is going over to you. If you go over to her, Christ has gone over to her. We are loaded. We are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. That's what the scripture says. Ambassadors are, that's political, right? It's not religious, it's political. God sent us. See, religious is, there's one thing about religion, all right? Powerless. It's one characteristic of all religion. In the, even the witchcraft stuff, they're always trying so hard but really, when they come in contact with the light and the kingdom of God, they'd lose all their power instantly. So, but religion, the rote religion, the things the people in just doing what they do and trying, hopefully they get closer to God. It's characterized by powerlessness. But an ambassador is full of power. He comes with the authority of the king who sent him. Who's our king? Jesus. He sent us. We have full authority full authorization to do the work that he sent us to carry out. And that work requires full participation. You see, I don't want part of my body to do my work. That's called paralysis. 
I want every single, I want access to every limb, every finger, every this, every that, so I can really enjoy life. And Jesus is the head seated in heaven. And it says we are his body seated also in the heavenlies with him and on earth to carry out his will, his thoughts, his desires. He thinks something, we do it. That's how it works. All right, so let's, let's move forward on this because I'm going to teach you some, give you some huge gold nuggets that you can take with you for, for, for decades. Some of these truths you could take with you, apply it for decades. Because the church, the real one, the Bible one, is the legislature. Now let's look at a couple verses about that. Tyler, you didn't know I'm, a, I, I'm into demolition as well. And Pastor Luis, I know he's on the field right now, but he's demolition, reconstruction. Me too, me too. I just didn't tell you guys. It's spiritual, only spiritual so far. <laughs> so because we have to demolish the idea of quote unquote church. And there's another title of this message. I said it's the end of church as you know it. You know, want, to know, want to know what the other title is? No more Mr. Church guy. How about that? <laughs> no more Mr. Church girl. All right. You'll know why in a minute. So Jesus, look, let's look at Revelations 1, 5 to 6. How about that? Jesus Christ, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Okay, we'll move on from that. Let's look at the legislature of God, which is in Corinth. If you change the word in your Bible from church to legislature, it'll give you a whole different feeling of the whole thing. And you'll start to see how God sees in this. It's, uh, we, we see here Christ, which means, by the way, the anointed king. That's one of the meanings of Christ, the anointed one. The one that means the king and the priest. But it says he's head of the legislature. And the legislature is subject to Christ, the anointed king. That's in uh, Ephesians, by the way. Now we're going to look here at Colossians 1.24. See, because this, we need to clear up confusion about church. And we need to accept the true one and not the counterfeits. Because Jesus said, the anointed, uh, okay, he said, Christ's body, okay, the anointed king's body, Christ's body, which is the legislature. That's Colossians 1.24. If you look at Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, he put all things under his feet. Thank God we're at least his feet. We're his feet or up. Each one of us. Thank God. All things are under us. And he gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the legislature, the church, which is his body. So what is the church. It's the body of Christ. It's you. It's an identity. If you're on the airplane, it's on the airplane. If you're in, if you're shoveling dirt or sand or snow, Christ is shoveling dirt, sand or snow. His legislature is shoveling. It is everything we are. And that's why the Bible says, be aware and be careful what you don't get involved in, what you get involved in, because it says, shall we take the members of Christ and make them members of the prostitute? It says, may it never be. Why? Because we are his body. We're inseparable with him now. And so we need to be in sync with what he thinks and what he does and where he goes so that we can give him pleasure so that we can be aligned and be in sync with the kingdom of God so we can bear fruit. So the king's body, which is our identity, is actual church. Church is not a building. Church is not a meeting. Did you know that? Church is not a meeting. No, it's, that's called a meeting of the church. Church is not an organization. That's simply an organization within the church. Very powerful. We need organizations because we need networks. But if they become inward and they say, you belong to me and all this stuff and you come in, that's what most of them do, unfortunately. Because, and I'm going to tell you partly why, then you never go outward with the gospel. The whole goal is that his, he fill all things and that he go to every single nation through us with his message and the life to fill and fill totally free the captives and to fill all things, to set people free. 
And this is what it's about before he comes back. We need to rule. He's gone, so we rule. We're here to rule in his stead as kings under the king of kings. So he sent us to go take our place, rule, shine, free people. And it happens every time we go and we're growing in this. But the typical idea of what church is includes four walls. Why? Because we need places to meet, all right? We need meeting places. This is an amazing building. But it's not a church. Because if you think this is church, you won't be the church nine to five. You won't be the church when you're walking to, when you're pumping the gas and the person next to you needs healing or needs freedom or needs a smile. You'll be thinking about something else. And then you get into the building and shape up, make sure I'm good now for church. Yeah, yeah. No, you are the church. You can't be kicked out of a church, by the way. How many guys been kicked out of a church? You can't be kicked out of a church. My goodness, you are the church. How are you going to be kicked out of yourself? It's not possible. That is not possible. If somebody says, hey, I'm going to kick you out of my church, I'm going to say, try it. I'm his church. I am his church. So if I somehow got into your church and you're going to kick me out of your church, something's wrong with that. How many churches are there? How many bodies are on this earth of Jesus? How many? Uno. No dos, no tres. No cuatro, no cinco. I'm pretty good, right? I'm trying. Uno. One. Punto final. Hermanos y hermanos. Yes. Final point. That's it. One with one head, and we're in this together. Isn't that wonderful? Say it with me, together. We got to support one another, love one another, teach one another, free one another, help one another. You know what I mean? Free is show us the freedom we all already have in Christ. But I mean, it's love one another, be at peace with one another, because we're members of his body. Same body, same DNA, same one. We're here. We're in it. And I'm going to tell you how this works practically because there can be some confusion. I'm here to clear up confusion today. I got my asbestos suit on and I'm doing the work. All right. Demolition. Because listen, the idea is this is my church. That's their church. This is whose church. This is me's church. This is Mr. Sue's church. This is it. Drop it. There's Jesus church and there's counterfeits out there. But Jesus church you can't number it. You can't count it. It can't fit in one building. It's spread throughout heaven and earth right now. And Jesus' church is his body. And specifically, it is ruling when it's active, obeying his, his thoughts, his words, his communication. When we do what he says, his rule is here. And that's what it is. So let's say that, you know, persecution arose. Persecution arose in the book of Acts. You had Jesus' church there. When it arose, they were scattered and they preached the word because they knew who they were. So we're talking about the identity of who we are and what a church really is. And I'm going to share with you one more here about his church because this is really good. Do you remember Jesus said the first time, you know, Jesus only used the word church twice. Do you know that? He used the word kingdom like hundreds of times in the scripture. So therefore and faith and things like that that are useful, practical. But church was like a unique thing, a revelation actually he brought out. And when did he do that? The first time was when Peter said, you are the Christ. Now remember, Christ to them, and it should be to us from now on, is a political term. Christ is a political term, a king. And they said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when he said that, Jesus commended him and he said, on this rock, I'm going to build my legislature. Why did he say that? Because he just recognized that he's a king. He just recognized he is the anointed king. And then he said, yes, and I have a legislature too. And it's coming out and I'm going to build it on the truth about me. And that is his body. So he was preparing them to be the legislature that he would build. And that's who we are. That's what he's building. And so understanding that helps because it is all political. And it is in you. It is of you. You are of it. It's you. So where you go, God goes. 
And he will lift up anybody through you if you just believe in love. Just love the person in front of you and use the training you've received. And the power of God is coming through you in full force. And then you get more training and more revelation. Our eyes are open more to the things, the truth about us and about God, about life, about how things work, about the spirit. And then the next time it's even greater because we go from glory to glory. But Jesus' body is glorious. That's how his church, his church is glorious. How do you distinguish it from all the religions of the earth? Glory. His church is glorious. His church is powerful. His church is loving. They shall know my disciple. You're my disciples by your love for one another. His church is living. His church doesn't e isn't even here. It looks like it's here because our bodies are here, but it's actually seated in the heavenlies. His church. There's nothing earthly about it. It's not physical. It is not carnal physical. It's not carnal. It's not physical. It is royal and it is powerful. How many, how many of you guys are happy you're part of that? Are you happy you're part of that? It's amazing, right? Now, this is not a university lecture and I'm not going to teach point by point by point and keep you all day. I could do that. I would love to do that. But what I will do is move this along and talk to you about three, three aspects of his church that need to be reformed. Reformed. We talked about identity already, but we're going to talk about ministry and activity. All right? So the identity is that it's you and that it's me. All right? That's another reason he said, accept one another as Christ accepted you. Because when I look at you, Caleb, I'm seeing a king as part of the legislature of God himself, Jesus being your head. So I better respect that man. See how it works? A lot of respect goes on. Honor, because we recognize who we are, that we're not just members of a quote unquote church. Please don't talk like that anymore. We are members of his body. That means his one church spread throughout heaven and earth. I did want to share this with you though. The boundaries of a church. All right, this will really get you. If you're serious and if you're listening, this will get you. This will boil you. I want you boiled up, all right? Uh, none of these soft boiled eggs. The times have come. We need to know these things and act on them, all right? Now, a church, the church, the church is his body. What is a church? A church simply means his body, his church, in a particular location. Okay? So in other words, in the scripture, if you look, and I've got like something like a hundred different examples in this book. It's amazing how I just documented it. You see that the typical, the normal, the standard boundaries of a church in scripture is the boundaries of the city that it's in. In other words, in Johnston, there's one church. In Providence, there's one church. In actual fact, there's really only one, but there's one aspect of it. Per city. Per city. With many leaders. It's very, very easy to document this in the scripture. That's how they thought. That's how they lived. Therefore, there were no divisions between them. Now, the divisions are there if they act carnal. But, I mean, they could see that, no, they, we're all in the same church here. Same church. we got to see this. We don't all have the same leaders. The leadership's different. But there's unity, and we're the same church, which is Jesus' church. We've been redeemed. We've been lifted up. When we lose that stuff, these truths, that's where cults start forming. Because they want to be their own separate entity and take you into themselves and own you. And they are rampant. They're all over. And a lot of them aren't called cults, but they operate like it. And they reject you if you want to do anything else. That's not God whatsoever. Jesus' way is, he says, follow me, you're following him. Then he sends you gifts, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, shepherds, and others to help you reach your destiny to minister to more people. See how it's very different? The traditional form is you got to join a church, meaning get, find a building and sit there every day and do these different things. No, you need to grow spiritually. 
And that means you need, a, you need to get the word into you, but you also, I want you to know in that whole time, when you're in part of the embassy here, don't think this is your church. Your church is you. You are his church, okay? So you are his church. This is your spiritual family because Apostle Charles, apostles in the scripture are fathers. He and Pastor Don are a spiritual father and mother but it doesn't rob you of the rest of the body of Christ. You're in and you have access to everything of Jesus. And the wisdom of God that he's trying to teach you is get good teaching, like Apostle Charles Pasadonis, plug in and get it to the full and don't listen to the false teachers because they will dilute it, they will pollute it, they'll try to pollute you is what they're trying to do. So it's very important to understand how to navigate the system and the world. But we also need to understand this one church reality. Okay? You guys still with me? Are you with me? All right. Good, good, good. I'm telling you some basics, that, but unfortunately it's very rare. And so we need to get it because the walls will come down. All right? All right. So that's identity. The next one's ministry. Now, what is a minister? Remember, we're going to release 100 ministers per year. I think it was. I got to look at that again. But 100, that's just minimum, just marks. We're releasing them, meaning we, we help send them. Now, what is a minister? Is it a guy who wears a collar here? Is it a guy who wears a suit and tie and stands up here with a microphone? What's a minister? Are you ready? Do you have your pen and paper? In the original language, minister means servant. That's the real meaning of minister is servant. All right? Now, Listen to this statement. Every disciple of Jesus, every believer is a minister and is called to minister. That's to ministry. Every single one. All right? So that's ministers. Not everyone is a leader. We're going to talk about that. Leaders is different than minister. Does this make any sense to you? Is it making sense? Leaders include ministers because every disciple of Jesus is a minister and has something to offer and to give. And it starts right when you get born again because you have this experience with Jesus. You heard the truth. You could tell somebody else. When you do, you're ministering. And then it grows in different areas as you grow. That's your ministry. So I want you to see yourself as extremely important to God's purpose and plan. And the fact is that you have a powerful, powerful ministry. All right. Does that make sense? Because it's the king's ministry in you, through you. So it can do anything, and there is nothing hidden from that. He sent, it, he sent you that way as his ambassador. So you're a minister. So I could call each of you minister. And leadership is different. Now leaders, are you with me still? Are you with me? Leaders are called in the Bible overseers. They are the apostles, the elders, and there are all, all of us are leaders and all of us in different capacities. But in the scripture, leaders watch out for, they oversee God's people's growth and ministries. Okay? So a leader you may not even know is there among you because they're watching, but they're not necessarily doing much. I've been watching you guys for a good year. Most, a lot of you have been here for a year. I watch you guys constantly, consistently. I'm watching. That's what I do because I'm a leader. Notice, leaders don't do all the work. They watch and they look out and if somebody's really about to fall, they grab them like that. And if someone needs some extra information, they may set up a teacher to come in and teach that area. I'm teaching now because you guys need this information, but I'm also a leader. But the leader is not the teaching part. Is this making any sense to you? Yes. So I want you to be very, very clear on these things because you are the ministers that are going to help carry out the vision that I read in the beginning, which is part of Kingdom Embassy International. I want you to know, I want, we need to raise up our dignity, our understanding of our dignity, that we are in Christ, have something very special for this world. Every single one of us, very special. You have a voice that is a force to be reckoned with. You have God inside of you, and he will come out of you as you step out and serve others. 
because that's the ministry of Jesus himself in you working on the earth. And this is you. This is your responsibility. There's nothing, there's no one, you don't go to Bible school for to become a minister. You're one when you're born again. All right. Now leadership, leadership is needed and necessary. Now if you don't have a leader, everybody here does because I'm a leader. Pastor Luis is a leader. Pastor Charles, Pastor Don are leaders here for this group. But let's say that you didn't have one. If you didn't, Jesus is your leader. You're fine. Keep walking and God will send you leaders. And some people never get leaders. They're on their own the whole time. And what I mean by that on their own is like Apostle Paul, for example. He had leadership. He still, even he had them. But what I mean is rely on Jesus first. If you're relying on Jesus, you'll go the distance. If you're relying on human leaders, they'll probably fail you and you might stop your walk. But if you're relying on Jesus, they will enhance you. They will help you fulfill your plan and destiny, your ministry, your calling, what you're called to do. Because it's royal, it's glorious, and you need help to fulfill it. That's why God created leadership, leaders, and they have realms or territory, but it's not about my church and you're now you're in. No, 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 no. It's about love and giving and giving and giving and giving so that you become the best you you can be. Amen? The best you you can be. That's what this is all about. So ministry is how the life in you goes out to others. And the last one is the equipping ministries. I read that earlier, the fivefold ministry. I want to make this very clear to everybody here. Fivefold ministry, what is that? It's in Ephesians chapter 4, and I prefer to call it not fivefold ministry. I prefer to call it the equipping servants. You see, we're all kings, but when we choose to serve, we're servants. That's ministers. So the equipping servants are listed in Ephesians 4.11 as apostles. That means sent ones. Prophets. That's people who speak a specific message for God. Uh, evangelists. They take the gospel to the lost, specifically, like more than others. And they, you know, all of these are there to train everybody else to do these things. Teachers, shepherds. Shepherds care for the souls. Teachers teach. But all of them are there for the, it says, building up, maturing of everybody else so that they do works of ministry. So, here's the points. Here's my point. Here's why I'm standing here today. It's not to get information into your head as much as this. I want the information in your feet. In your feet. Because you are the feet of Jesus. And if you go, he gets to go. But if you don't go, he has to stay. And Jesus is tired of being in a cardboard box, warehoused. See what I'm saying? God sent Apostle Charles and Pastor Donna to us to teach us, to help us. But they're not here to babysit. If anything, that's me. I will babysit you a little bit. Not very long. I really won't. I don't tolerate the stuff. But they, will, they are high level. They're not thinking, how can I get you from baby Christian? Up? No, they're preaching. They're teaching the truth that will bring you up. But they've got a lot on their plate as apostles. They're sent and they're amazing people. And so in other words, we need each other. But what I'm saying is each of you here has personal responsibility to get beyond the walls and be the church. Be the church. I was in uh, Oregon recently and I was invited to help with an outreach. And I was standing in front of these people, you know, about, who knows, 100 people or 200 people or something, these young people, and we were praising. First, we're praising. And as we praised it with the music, you could feel God up in there. It was awesome. And then uh, it was my turn. And I stood up and I said, okay. Somebody had already said what I wanted to say, like two points about Jesus said go and something else. So I got up, I said what he said. And then I said, now listen, we got to, you know, it's time. It's time, all right? I said, so pair up two, three people and just go reach some unbelievers. Talk to them about Jesus. And I gave them a key. You remember Apostle Charles, uh, 
he teaches about keys, right? How many know, remember that, keys? You know that you can use a key in evangelism, it makes it so easy. God at that day gave me a key to give the people. It was this phrase. The phrase was, do you know that you can, uh, or no, would you like a touch, a taste of the love of God today? That was it. Would you like a touch of the love of God today? Simple phrase, but that was a key. And I said, use this key today. Maybe not tomorrow, definitely today. So we split up. I said, we'll meet back here in about half hour or whatever. Sonia and I walked up, immediately met a woman and her child and she had arthritis and she had something else and she was healed right there. She had had C-section uh, complications healed, her wrist arthritis was healed and she and her son gave her life to the Lord right there, then and there. We went to the next group, used the same key. They, they uh, received a serious touch of the power of God. They ended up laughing, they were drunk in the Holy Ghost. They didn't even accept Jesus, they just walked off but drunk. But they got a touch of the love of God. The next group, next group, the key was being used. You see what I mean? But a lot of the people, because they've been warehoused for so long, they didn't come back to give testimonies. I don't know that they went. They might have gone to their car, got on, and went home. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want that. He made us to give life, to be light in the world, in the darkness. He made us to go. And it's better to go and fail than to do nothing and fail. Because doing nothing, we fail automatically 100%. Going, we actually succeeded because we actually obeyed. He said, go. And so it is very important. The activities. When I said Mr. Reformation, the activities of the early Christians. Now, they weren't perfect. They didn't know very much on a lot of things. But they had certain activities that they did regularly. Acts chapter 2, the end of the, end of the chapter, it says they continually devoted themselves to these things. One was teaching. That's the fuel. Another was fellowship with one, and one with another. That's where we get to actually fellowship with each other and the Lord. But there's an exchange of words to each other. Life, testimonies, support, strength. And another one was prayer. Now, they didn't understand prayer. We know that. Because later they tried to pray Peter out of jail. When he got there, they, didn't even, they couldn't believe he was there. So that was not really praying. That was pleading. That was actually, you know, religious, religious people all think they know how to pray. And then uh, they find out, eventually the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray. They're like, okay, we have no clue what this even really is. But prayer was the third one. Praise, other priestly offerings. The next one in that list is giving financially. They gave to one another. They had a need, they gave. And they sowed, actually, because the harvest comes back. And they gave for the gospel. And the fifth one was outreach. The Lord continually added to their number daily those who were being saved. How could he do that daily? Well, one reason, they were being witnesses. This is our identity, witnesses, proof producers of the good news. This is who and what we are. It's not the evangelist's job. He has his job, let him do it. She has her job, let her do it. It's each of our jobs to be witnesses of Jesus and God will bring people every single day. Now, I'm not here today to be an accuser. That's the devil's job. He's a loser, we believe in the blood of Jesus, right? We're righteous by the blood of Jesus. But I'm here to strengthen you and to say we got to do different. A kingdom embassy international, no condemnation, and we got to grow from glory to glory, strength to strength. We have to grow. We can't do the same thing that we've been doing. And I don't mean grow in numbers like try to get people who are out I'm talking about grow yourself in depth of understanding and action. Those five activities we need to each be able to do. You need to be able to witness to your neighbor. You need to know how to share the gospel, the simple message of the gospel. How to heal the sick, like our sister Magdalene just did. How to set the people free. It's all in you. And as you learn to do it, you experience the most powerful, wonderful, awesome life. Testimonies flow over and over and over and over. The newest Christian can learn this. The newest Christian, anybody can learn this. What it takes is willingness to really 
do it. Not say do it, not sing do it, but step outside that wall. And that's what I'm here to say, to invite everyone to do, to invite you to do. Because in traditional church, I said the end of church as you know it, traditional church, not only is it us four and no more, the four walls and no more, but also you come and receive continually. And that's not okay for you. Why? It's more blessed to give than receive. So in addition to receiving, you got to give. And I'm here to help you. I'm one of the people here to help you know how to do that. Because once I get you started, very quickly, I could take anybody in here who hasn't healed the sick lately, let's say. I could take you out, find somebody who's sick. We could get you healing the sick within 10 minutes, five minutes. And uh, you'll be amazed. And you start to understand that all that knowledge put in you, how it works practically, it starts to come out of you. You heal your neighbor, you heal your mother, you heal your sister, you get someone else born again, you free somebody from this. It's amazing life. And that is where God wants to start. If we're going to be planting all these churches, which we will, which really what it means is not planting. What we're talking about is extending our influence into the world. We have so much good teaching. It needs to go out. Where we have the tools, we can go, three, four of us, the three of us, Monica, Tyler, and Jesse, and myself and Sonia, five of us, can go to another city next weekend. Don't come here. We could go there, find some people, and lead them to the Lord just like that, with the power of God in us, with the knowledge, the understanding of what I'm talking about, and the things we've already learned. We could set them free and start something in their house immediately. And we've extended our influence to that city. And this is what we need to start doing. I'm not just up here talking. You know why people don't do it? Fear. Let fear go right now. Another reason, it does cost you something. It takes your weekend, it takes this, it takes that. But it gives Jesus so much more than it costs you. And he double blesses you. Triple, triple blesses you, amen? You guys know why we went to Las Vegas? I said deep sea fishing. It was because we just finished the power school and we need to use that. Amen. And it was my birthday as well. So we said, we'll make it a birthday week and a birth week. And we went out there and every day, miracles, 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 miracles. And we ended up connecting with people who wanted to learn. They had like seven, eight people come with us, learn how to heal the sick, free people, go to other people. Yes, these things are what you can do too. You don't get it through qualifications of a minister. You are a minister. You get it through practice, through going. So I've said all this, and here's the practical tip for everybody in here. This is the exhortation. You can be warehoused and you're just hurting the Lord and you're hurting yourself and your future. Or you could stand up and say from this day on, in fact, I'd like everybody to stand, please. And say, from this day on, I will take every opportunity for outreach or to edify each other. Don't forget that commitment. It's in your hand now. We're doing outreaches every other Saturday. I'll be announcing it. I'll be announcing because next week we got a baptism deal, um, but we also are going to be doing outreach. But basically, the other name is the end of zombie church. I called it the end of zombie church. All right. That's the other name for this teaching. There's no more of the zombie stuff. Show up. Doom, 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 doom. No. You are what God is starting with in this generation. You're here to receive such glorious truths so you can put them to practice, setting people free. And we, I myself and other leaders here, will give you all the support, all the support. You're called to rule and reign. It includes, you know, the business, all the different things that you're growing and thinking, your dreams, the thing God sent you to, to, to fix for your generation. That, as Apostle Charles always teaches, is your platform. But what is the real life that comes out of you? It's what just happened with our brother here. And it'll happen through you, multiplied hundreds, thousands, millions of times. I mean, millions sounds big, right? 
but you're with people who have reached millions so that you can grow into the same. We're here to be conformed to Jesus' image, but Jesus' image is in Apostle Charles and Pastor Donna. We're being conformed to the same ministry they do, their image, and, and on the way to his image. And so therefore we cannot, the Bible says, do not be slothful indeed. We cannot be slow to act. We cannot do it. Jesus is walking by. He carries your destiny in his hand. And if you just let him go because you want to watch TV, you made the saddest, worst mistake. You see what I mean? I remember I was with my wife and someone invited me to go to a mall to go heal the sick. And I believe I was working really hard at the time at a, a, a current job that I had. And I was really tired and she was tired and it was kind of recovery time. We're sitting there, but there's also an opportunity to go reach people. And I just looked over to her and I said, let's go. And we got up and went and people got healed. And uh, guess what? Where'd that tiredness go? It disappeared. It's the exciting life God has for you, but you gotta make an exchange. All right, so I've told you the truth and it's up to you and I love you either way. You get around love, you're gonna be loved either way, no matter what you're doing. You'll figure it out someday, hopefully. But if you do it, you will be loving others actively in a new and powerful and fresh way and the door is open to you for this. So we're doing outreaches every other week, round tables. I talked to you in the past about round tables, right? I talked to you in the past about round tables. Let me just explain what it is real quick. Because when I told Apostle Charles, he loved the idea. Round tables, round tables is where you come together. If we'll just stop the music for a quick second, I want to share this piece of information. This is very, very, very important. Round tables is a format of fellowship. It's one of the activities lost in the dark ages. It's coming back. And that is, we already have, many of you already do this actively, but we need as a format, especially for the newer Christians and for all of us, where we come together, you're not coming just to receive, you're coming to give and to receive. So when you come, you sit in a smaller group that is round, <laughs> it doesn't have to be specifically, but meaning kings sit at round tables and you discuss current events, spiritual in your life, what you did this week, what testimonies you have. You see what I mean? What God has taught you. What is in you for the next person. Prophecy. Revelation. Things but with testing. Prophecy. Okay. Prophecy must be tested. But you're giving to one another and helping one another. This is round tables. You, might, you should come here. And this is how we flip church upside down. I've done this in the past. It always works. 15 years I did this. You, we flip it so that when you come... You do not, you cannot sit there with your mouth open. All right, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm smiling, right? When you come, you know you're going to be giving something of life in you. Therefore, when, with that expectation, during the week, you say, okay, I, I, I got to step it up. I got to get, I got to, okay. And then you start acting like a Christian 24-7. <laughs> you start acting like the church 24-7. And when you come back, there's going to be testimonies and testimonies and te piling up. And people will come in here who need to hear the teaching also. And the teaching as well. So round tables, we're going to start that back up at some point. And I need your help. I just didn't, I didn't push it because I was watching to see who really cared. But I know it is for God's people. Outreach is coming back. It's for God's people. You've made the commitment with the Lord. We're going to move on. But he said, but I heard you say, I will take every opportunity. All right. So let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Praise King Jesus. Um, we're going to, where we are wrapping this up. I decided to go with a, le uh, with a very serious message today. A very serious message to try to pull you up in a new and different way. All right. No more Mr. Church. It's time to take this world for Jesus. How many guys are in? All right. Praise King Jesus. All right. So we're going to have uh, the offering. Come on up, my brother.
Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Can we just uh, thank the man of God? Hallelujah. Appreciate you, Pastor David. Amen. See, the Word of God is meant to be rightfully divided. Can you agree? We're called to reach this world. I love the titles, by the way. <laughs> because, see, what we're doing is we're establishing a kingdom in this world. Hallelujah. We're building something that's much bigger than us. And I can't emphasize that enough because it's not about me. My agenda is my ideas. It's the king's agenda. Whatever the king has, that's what I connect to. And we are in a house that we elevate that bar every single week, every single time we gather because we don't believe in status quo. We don't believe in what the church is doing because the church has done absolutely nothing since Jesus came the first time. And we need to change that. Hallelujah. We are, a, uh, we are sitting, sitting here as kings. We're sitting here as priests and kings in this world. And we are here to manifest his glory. I just wanted to uh, recognize, I'm going to put him on the spotlight for a second. But a man of God, Caleb, is dressed so royal. Hallelujah. <laughs> he can handle the spotlight. Amen. Hallelujah. But I'm always reminded every time I come here that we're royalty. Not just because of what we do or how we do it, but because of who we are. There's a beautiful song that I love. It's, uh, it, let, let the world see Jesus in your eyes. You know your eyes are the window of the soul. When people see Jesus in your eyes, they see the possibility of heaven coming to earth. They see something that's different because the world doesn't care that you know Jesus. They care that you have something to carry to them. And we just want to uh, look at uh, Deuteronomy Hallelujah. 8.18, it says this. It says, You shall remember the Lord your God. Let's look at that. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you the power to get wealth. Say it is He that gives me the power to manifest wealth in this world. Do you know you can't reach people without money? It's proven. <laughs> You can pray to get a plane, but the plane doesn't come unless you're diligent. The hand of the diligent, not the hand of the slack. We put our hands to the plow and we don't look back. We're pushing the kingdom forward. Amen. And we bring our gift before the king because it is our offering. It is our understanding that he is greater. I have seed to sow. I have a release in me. He's given us seed. He says that when you release seed, more is given. So that means I got to release more seed every single time. So we want to do that this morning. We want to release our seeds. We want to release what God has given us. Uh, our apostle, my dad, Apostle Charles and Defon, uh, says this all the time. He says that our paycheck is our seed bag. What we do with it is our choice. If we choose to spend it on things that pleasure us, that's awesome. But it comes to poverty. But if we choose to increase the kingdom, in other words, if we choose to invest it, make an investment into somebody else, Great things happen and great things align with us. Hallelujah. We want to bring our gift this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, those of you that are here, uh, we encourage you if you want to give by way of cash or check, we have the envelopes for you to fill out your details. And those of you that want to bring your gift by, um, by way of a uh, uh, credit card, we have our sister in the front here uh, for you to my right. So that you want to make your way around those of you that are on this side. Those of you that are online, you go to Christlove.org and click the donate button. Hallelujah. What a great blessing it is that we can be in this house and we can be among each other and encourage and equip each other. We're going to go to uh, also we have paypal.me forward slash Charles and Defon. We have a few other ways to give. We have the uh, cash app as well for you. It's the cash symbol uh, Charles and Defon. And for those of you that want to use Venmo, it's the at symbol DR Charles hyphen and Defon. And uh, they're going to pull that up on the screen for you. Uh, and you also want to write out a check for those of you that are uh, writing checks out online. You can write it out to Christ Love Media, P.O. Box 72800, Providence, Rhode Island, 02907. Amen. We're going to worship. The man of God is going to take it from here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So for this week, um, and just throughout this week and beyond, for whatever you're doing, just take an extra look at yourself in the mirror because you are the evidence of God's goodness and His goodness looks so good on you. So take an extra look at yourself in the mirror and just be like, wow. Hallelujah. As we worship and behold your face, the light of your contentment shines 
in us and we radiate your love as we worship and behold your face the light of your contentment shines in us and we radiate your love as we worship and behold your face the light of your contentment shines in us and we radiate your love to your love your goodness looks good on us your goodness looks good on us and we wear your glory and we wear your glory your goodness looks good on us your goodness looks good on us And we wear your glory And we wear your glory As we worship, as we worship And behold your face The light of your continent shines on us And we radiate your love As we worship for everybody next weekend next Saturday we're having baptisms for those who haven't been immersed in water before after you believed the baptism is for you so I'd like you to come see actually see Racklin before you leave today and tell her if you have not been baptized in water and you want to be baptized a lot of people were baptized in water but it was just a swimming expedition for them just they just went swimming they didn't know what they were doing but you want to get the information the knowledge of what it really is and when you get that and you do it with revelation not as a rote ritual not a religious thing there's power in it because it's of him everything of him has power and he said believe and be baptized so when you believe you start the work in your heart you're born again and this next thing first step be baptized. So I know, Will, you just believed solidly. Hallelujah. You can be baptized this coming weekend. Other people who haven't, some of y'all, some of you 
have known and walked with Jesus a long time, but you didn't know what baptism was, you can be baptized. It's this coming Saturday. Um, and we, the, the, we may even need to change the date, depending. But speak with Racklin today about it, if that's you, okay? And for those online, stay tuned because uh, if Apostle Charles or myself or someone teaches on the subject, you'll want to know more about it for yourself if you haven't been baptized. It's a burial. Burial. Baptized into his death. Raised with him to walk in newness of life. So that's what baptism is the start of all that stuff. And we're going to end with this. Everybody repeat after me. The grace of the Lord Jesus. The, grace of the, Lord Jesus. the love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and always will be. Amen. You are good.